Hi, this is part 2 of a build series for a new offline controller for my 6040 CNC router. If you haven't done so already, I would recommend that you watch part 1 first, since this build is mostly in chronological order, and in part 1 you can see how we got to the point where we are now. So let's continue the assembly process. Here I am installing the mains power switch that was discussed earlier. The front of the switch has to be removed before it can be mounted to the side of the cabinet. Now it's just a matter of aligning it properly and drilling some holes for the mounting screws. There are three ventilation holes in the cabinet. Two for the inlet and one for the outlet of air. Behind the outlet a fan is mounted that will push out the warm air from the cabinet. Over the inlet ports covers are placed with a basic dust filter. This is a very coarse filter but at least it will keep out the larger dust particles. The fan on the old controller was very loud, and I like to keep the noise level down as much as possible when the router is not in operation. So I went for an 80mm Noctua fan. This has all kinds of features to reduce the noise level, including rubber mounts and specially designed fan blades to prevent turbulent airflow. It comes with three different cables. Depending on which cable you select, you can run the fan on low, medium or high speed with of course the highest speed delivering the highest airflow but also being the least quiet. I ended up going for the low setting. It seems to generate enough airflow for this application. If I find out later that air exhausted from the cabinet is too hot, I can always go to a higher setting. I'm not using the rubber fan mounts in this case, because where the fan is located they would be hard to install. The use of screws does not add any significant vibrations or noise from what I can tell. After mounting the fan, I tried to place the backboard into the cabinet. Unfortunately, I had to remove the main switch and put it back in its place afterwards. Not too much work, but it definitely pays to think ahead. I'm connecting the fan to a small power supply. I cut one of the connector cables that I would not need in half and placed uh, some connectors on the ends so I could hook it up to the power supply. With this setup I can connect the fan directly to full power or insert one of the low noise adapter cables in between just by unplugging the connector. The fan has three wires coming out of it. Red and black for power and yellow for the RPM control. I'm not using this feature so I cut off the yellow wire. This is the small 24 volt power supply that I bought specifically for the safety circuit. It is low power since it's only used to activate the contactor. The power supply itself is connected directly to mains power, so it can actually be used to power the contactor. The form factor is much nicer in my opinion than that of the other small power supply. It is smaller, you cannot touch the contact and it mounts to a DIN rail. In hindsight, I also should have bought a DIN rail version for the other small power supply, but since that was already fixed in place, I decided to leave it the way it was. I wanted to use flexible wire for the connections between the various high voltage components. This is probably not best practice, but I salvaged wire from a used 230 volts power cord. This means I'm using brown and blue wires for the high voltage connections. This is not according to any EN standards, but keep in mind this is a hobby project and not intended for commercial use. As far as I know you should be using black for mains voltage, but since I'm already using black as a neutral wire for the low power circuits, I did not want to get the two mixed up. So please don't use this video to try and figure out what color of wire you should be using for your project, as what you're seeing here is not according to any standard. I used the appropriate crimp connectors to be able to connect the wires to the main connector and other components.
Here I'm trying to crimp connectors to the wires for stepper drivers that are salvaged from the old controller. Unfortunately, they did not have any screw terminals for the wires, which is far easier when you're making your own controller. I made several attempts to make connectors that had reliable connections, but had one failure after another. It might be that I'm using the wrong pliers or just lack of skill, but I could not get the connectors to firmly grip the wires. Before realizing this, I actually completed all of the wires and even started installing them in the cabinet. Here's an example of how I am able to pull the wires from the connector fairly easily. Therefore, I decided to go for another solution. Since you can buy stepper drivers for less than 20 euros these days, I ordered some new ones and started the wiring process again. The new stepper drivers have screw terminal blocks which can also be removed if necessary. The USB plug will be placed on the top left of the front panel. The cable gives you the freedom to place the USB connector anywhere you like. Since the connector is rectangular in shape, this again requires some cutting and filing. Next up is the cable for the MPG. Also here, a cable is needed that runs from the back of the controller to a connector on the outside of the cabinet. In this case, the top panel. Unfortunately, this cable does not come supplied with the controller. I opted for a 15-pin sub-D connector that I manually soldered to the cable. And of course, some more cutting and filing. I would have liked to have mounted the connector from the inside, but the plastic housing is quite thick so it had to be mounted from the outside. Less pretty, but it works. For the flat cable, I printed out a cable clamp, which I designed in Fusion 360. It is based on a design I found on Thingiverse, but now that I want to reference it, I can't find it anymore between the many designs people have posted. 
I will place my own version of this clip on Thingiverse or GrabCAD as well and I will link it below. In a local electronics store, I also bought a nice connector that makes a connection with each wire lead by just cutting into it. Unfortunately, it turned out not to be so simple. It just didn't seem to close properly. At closer inspection, it turned out that the connector had a different pitch than the flat cable that I was using. Here you can see it compared to some old flat cable I had laying around. To prevent another trip into town just for a new connector, I ended up soldering this side as well. Here is an overview of how to wire the MPG controller. In the old situation, my VFD is controlled through the Mach 3 breakout board. I will be controlling the VFD in the same way, using the 0 to 10 volt signal input to control spindle speed. On both the DDCS controller and the VFD, I'm indicating that at 0 volts the spindle should stop, and at 10 volts the spindle should be at maximum RPM. In this case, 24,000. Any other voltage in between will set the spindle to the corresponding spindle speed. For example, if your NC program has a spindle speed command for 12,000 RPM, the DDCS controller will output 5 volts and the VFD will then know it has to control the speed to 12,000 RPM. There is also a start-stop signal connected to the VFD, so you can start the spindle from within your NC program with the M3 command. The controller also offers the possibility to change the spindle direction. But since I'm only using the clockwise direction, just being able to turn it on or off is fine. The connections are as follows. R and S are for 230 volts main power connection. U, V and W go out to the spindle. The common terminal is connected to the negative common terminal on the DDCS controller. This is to make sure that the negative common connection is at the same voltage level between the controller and the VFD instead of being a floating voltage. A in 1. This is a 0 to 10 volt input for controlling the spindle speed. Make sure that the A in 1 jumper to the left of the terminal block is set to 10 volts, not to the 20 milliamp setting. The X1 terminal is used to turn the spindle on or off. Open is off and connected to ground is on. I also went through all the parameter settings on the VFD, but it did not change any of them. I will leave a PDF file on my website with all the parameter settings in case you're interested. When all of the wiring was completed, I was not quite happy with the combination of cheap terminal blocks and separate wire connectors. Therefore, I replaced these with two sets of PT fix distribution blocks. One set is connected to the main power switch, and the other set is only live when the contactor is engaged. I chose the PT fix series because they're compact and easy to use. The individual blocks can be snapped together. The set of blocks can then be mounted onto a DIN rail fixture by just sliding them in. There are also individual DIN rail fixtures available if you want to have the blocks mounted in parallel to the DIN rail. Just for comparison, here they are side to side to the more traditional terminal blocks, which take up more space and require the use of conductors as well as end caps. I'm sure these have their place, but for my application, the PT fix distribution blocks are the preferred option.
This is the first set, which is connected to the mains power switch. On this set, I included a terminal block for all ground wires. This is the second set, switched by the contactor. I think this looks at least a bit cleaner, although not as good as I had hoped. It's better to use cable ducts between the components, but this would require an even larger enclosure. So I'll we'll keep it like this for now. A tool probe to measure the tool length can also be used with the DDCS controller. I'm using the probe that came with my router. The probe is connected to pins 1 and 4 on the DDCS controller. There's a separate screen available on the controller to monitor the status of the inputs and outputs. I use this to verify if the probe was connected properly. The tool probe has a clamp that attaches to the end mill. When the tool comes down and touches the base of the probe, it makes an electrical connection. The DDCS controller has a built-in probe function to measure the tool length. This routine lowers the z-axis until the tool makes contact and then sets the top of your stock material to zero. You can enter the thickness of your sensor into the controller, so it automatically adds this value to the measurement. Ever since I've had this router, I've always wanted to upgrade it with a fourth axis, so I included that as well in this project. I added a fourth axis stepper driver and connected it to the DDCS controller. The wiring is exactly the same as for the X, Y and Z axis. I will include the software parameter settings in the written article linked below and may also address these in a future video if that makes sense and if there's a need for it. I bought a typical fourth axis set from AliExpress, the cheap kind with a belt drive. I hope this provides enough rigidity for cutting woods and plastics, but when making this video I have not actually used it yet since Fusion 360 recently disabled multi-axis machining for the free license. My plan is to program it with FreeCAD. I made a cable out of the same shielded wire that I used to connect the stepper drivers. To transfer the cable through the enclosure, I used the same GX16 connectors as were used for the other axes.
To verify if the spindle RPM is aligned with the program speed, I measured the spindle speed at various settings across the range between 1000 and 24000 RPMs. As you can see in the graph, the spindle speed behaves very nicely and is perfectly linear except in the lower range. This can probably be tweaked with VFD parameters, but for my purpose this is definitely acceptable. I mounted an external e-stop to the controller as mentioned in the previous video. It is a very sturdy e-stop with two normally closed switches, which are connected in series for redundancy. So only one of the switches has to function for the e-stop to work. It is wired in such a way that it will disengage the connector and thereby cut power to the motors and the VFD. As you can see in this demonstration, the stepper motor stops almost instantly and the spindle slowly comes to a stop as it is no longer powered. Here you can see the e-stop on the MPG in action, which works a bit differently. It puts the controller in e-stop mode. The response is faster in this case. The stepper stop immediately and the spindle is rammed down by the VFD, so also this stops faster. There is a third benefit. The controller actually knows that there is an e-stop condition, so it pauses the program, whereas the program keeps running with the external e-stop, even though the machine itself has stopped. It is possible to rewire the external e-stop to an input on the controller. This should give you similar results to the e-stop on the MPG. And lastly, a dry run with a simple test program. A nice feature in the DDCS controller is the real-time plotting function, so you can see where you are in the program which is especially handy if you're cutting air instead of real parts. From what I can tell, everything seems to work fine. I've tried to cover as much as I could on this project within a reasonable amount of time. I've not decided yet if I will make more videos on this controller. I will see if there are any topics that are worth a more detailed look. Meanwhile, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below and I will do my best to answer them. And in case you're wondering, yes, the fourth axis also works. If you think this video was useful for you, please leave a like or subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.